This is Father Patrick Briscoe. This is Father Joseph Anthony Cress. Welcome to God's Planning. Thanks to all those who support us. If you enjoy the show, please consider making a monthly donation on Patreon. Be sure to like and subscribe to God's Planning wherever you listen to your podcasts. So, Father Joseph Anthony. Let's crack a lock and buddy. I was thinking the other day <laughs> of all the things that happen while we're celebrating mass, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, so I know the celebration of Holy Mass is important to both of us. Obviously we're both priests, but yep. but I think in a kind of particular way, uh, right now at the House of Studies, I'm the house liturgist. Okay, all right. And I'm teaching the deacon practicum. So I'm walking through mm. the deacons, kind of giving them a sense of how they are supposed to conduct themselves as servants of the sacred liturgy. So I'm thinking about the liturgy a lot. Um, in a kind of foreign way, and mm-hmm, I know I know mm-hmm. you I know you do at um, at your parish as well, and you, you've had some you've had some some kind of atypical examples of that, right? Oh like, yeah, um, I, yeah. So it's I've been very blessed um, to be a priest now for what are we at seven years, seven and a half years, mm, something yeah, in that I know, change. It just keeps rolling, man. Yeah. Ooh, man, it gets you. Um, and like I said, I'm very blessed and I've been able to celebrate mass every day since my priestly ordination. Um, if, if not a few times a day, you know, uh, given different circumstances and situations. Um, and it's been, it's been a nice opportunity to reflect on that and all the different kind of circumstances, contexts, and, um, even locations that I've been able to offer the sacrifice of the mass. And, um, it's been, it's been a privilege and there's, there's a beauty to that. You know, I've, I've been lucky enough to celebrate mass in, in gorgeous cathedrals and churches and, at, you know, with auspicious events, you know, with ordinations and marriages or anniversaries or, or um, things like that. And crowds of thousands as well, you know, can celebrate mass in uh, crowds of thousands with pilgrimages and, and uh, other kind of high water marks like World Youth Day and, and things like that. But I, I will say that, that each time you celebrate mass, like it, it does have this profound uh, effect on the priest. Um, there's, and we can get into, or we will get into all the nitty gritty of these things, but there, there's a, a beauty to the consistency of the presence of God in the Eucharist, whether mm-hmm. it's a, a private mass, a personal mass um, in the priory's small chapel, or where you're uh, surrounded by thousands of the body of Christ and thousands of members of, of Christ. And so um, it, it is something that there's always a risk. If you do something every day consistently, you know, even for weeks at a time, let alone years at a time, that you'll become complacent with it. Mm. You know, as a priest, there's always that risk that mm-hmm. because our lives are so oriented to the sacred, that we are so proximate to sacred things that we become complacent with it. And so it's a great opportunity to always reflect and remind yourself of the realities that are happening in front of you, the great gift and privilege it is to hear confessions or to celebrate mass, that these are beautiful, profound, sacred moments in even the repetition of it or the the proximity of it um, should remind us to not become complacent with it. And I think that's something that's a, that's, a, that's a struggle, but as a priest, you always have to be mindful of. And sometimes it's it takes your brothers, right? <laughs> you know, like it takes your brothers to experience like, you know, uh, to, to share that experience of, I had a profound moment, uh, celebrate mass or preaching, or I had a, a night worth of a few hours of confessions, but they were beautiful confessions. Just to keep us mindful that, yeah, we are um, very, proximate and, and comfortable and used to these sacred moments, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't mean that we become complacent with it. Right. Right. So we want to talk a little bit on this episode about what the priest uh, experiences and what he's doing when mm-hmm. he leads the mm-hmm. assembly in worship, especially in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. Uh, so maybe let, let's talk a little bit about, uh, about what begins before Mass, about how a priest prepares for liturgy. You yourself are a a kind of noted plan of liturgies, great and small. You've got a particular skill in organizing these things. Things don't always go according to plan in liturgy. I think <laughs> no. that I think that that's part of uh, part of our starting our starting point, right? Because um, the the liturgy is is first and foremost the work of God, but it's also very human because yep. God is working in our lives oh, yes. in very real ways. So, I was thinking of um, wild things that have happened to me during the celebration of Mass. There was a great moment where a number of my family members were gathered mm-hmm. uh, over the summer, and we were at a little chapel by one of the lakes in northern Indiana. 
And uh, so already there's a kind of extra crowd of people because this is my mother's family. So it's a lot of people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And towards the end of the mass, um, we had concluded um, the distribution of Holy Communion and there was a quiet moment of prayer. And then to introduce the final prayer, the prayer after communion, I said the invocation, right? The invitation to prayer, let us pray. And my nephew yelled out from the back of the church, (laughs) No, uncle, no. <laughs> uh, so I had to pause you know, and say like, okay, Gabriel, you know, actually, yeah, we, we are going to pray. Uh, yeah. And the, as the, my family and then the chapel was chuckling. So, th- so things like that happen and they, they, um, they, they're part, they're part of the experience of the sacred liturgy. So you, do you have any stories like that? Oh my goodness. Uh, far too many. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of my own humanity that's involved. <laughs> um, and my humanity is weak and frail. It, sometimes you do things. I mean, very recently, um, I was saying mass, uh, at the parish on a Sunday mass and, um, it got a, for a similar point after the communion, uh, instead of, uh, saying, let us pray, which is like, you know, the nice little Catholic signal for everybody to stand up. Um, I just went and said, the Lord be with you. It was the wrong introduction. Everybody was like, uh, <laughs> what I was like, no, let us pray. Let, yeah. Yeah. Uh, wh- what do I say right now? Um, but I think those moments, um, I know for seminarians, young men discerning the priesthood, um, and preparing, and even a lot of, a lot of young priests, um, you want everything to be perfect. Mm. You want everything to be just seamless. Everybody knows what to do and it just is all put together. But there's that reality that, you know, sometimes it's a little rough and sometimes surprises happen. And I know as a priest, like even in those moments, it's it's beautiful and good to embrace that. And so like in that moment where I said the wrong introductory phrase, it was just, yeah, I, I laughed at that and just said, oh, I'm so sorry, excuse me. All right, let's move into the right place. Let us pray. And I think it's important for, you know, the people of God to recognize that in our approach to God in these sacred moments, it's not perfection. It's human. Right. And the grace of God is very real and active in those moments, even if there is something that is a a little rough shod maybe or unexpected and, and things like that. So there's that, you know, you mentioned as lead into this, like, let's start about like what happens before mass and like the preparations that go into that. And I think as a priest, part of those preparations is the reality that Lord, I'm going to bring my humanity into this, right. just like you took on our humanity in your incarnation. So I surrender my humanity to that. And it might be a little rough and it might be a little, it's not going to be perfect, but I want to give you what I got. And there've been many, many a times when, um, you know, I've been, I've been ill. I've been very sick and I have like, I'm running a high fever, but I'll get my butt down to the chapel and say, Lord, I don't have much to give to you right now. Like my body is really beaten up and broken up and I can't really focus, but I'm going to celebrate the sacrament. I'm going to give you what I got. Mm. And I think that's always like my final thought as I leave the sacristy and I'm vested and get ready to go into the churches, Lord, I'm going to give you what I got. And there are many, many days I wish it was better. (laughs) <laughs> I wish I had more to mm. give or, or mm. something better to give the mm. Lord. But at the end of the day, all I have is what I have. And so I give the Lord what I got and I want to do the best I can and, and, and leave it there. Um, one of the images that I've always found very comforting, and it was an image and, and a quotation that I actually put on the back of my uh, priestly ordination kind of keepsake prayer card. Um, and I had submitted it and it got printed up, you know, hundreds or thousands. I forget how many we printed up for those things. And it had a typo in it. So we had to do a rush order, like 48 hours before that. You remember this cause you were part of figuring this out. Right. But, uh, the quote is from blessed Columba Marmion on his book on the priesthood, uh, Christ, the ideal of the priest. And he talks about how, um, the church clothes the priest with the vestments, mm as the firstborn son, you know, the the story of Jacob and Esau, you know, the firstborn son or or the the younger son clothes himself in the, 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 the sheepskin and and things like that to approach the father and ask for the, the, the birthright. And so in the priest clothing himself with vestments, we're clothing ourselves in the firstborn son, Christ, so that we can ascend up to the father and ask for the birthright in that sense. And so as those preparations happen, I remember and always 
being that mindfulness that I'm, this is a privilege to celebrate this mass, but I'm celebrating it in, in the place enclosed in, of Jesus Christ, but I still have my humanity at play in this. So I give what I can, even though I'm clothing myself, what I'm doing is not of my accord. I can't do this stuff. I can't offer this sacrifice. I can't say these words and turn bread into wine into the body and blood of Jesus just because I think it's good to do. But it is really dependent on the power of Christ. So as a priest, I have to remind myself of that more and more and more. That's a that's a great transition. So, we, so we've enunciated some principles here, right? First, the liturgy is God's work, mm -hmm. and God uses our frail humanity as His instrument to bring yeah. about His grace to to uh, to share those graces with His people. Um, and you know, we've said, okay, so so things happen in the liturgy uh, that are due to frail humanity, not yes. not to God. Um, and uh, I think it's interesting the what you what you've laid out here, how you how you talked about how the priest is clothed actually in Christ. Um, because what what happens when a priest begins to celebrate mass um, actually begins where a lot of people don't see in the sacristy. Mm -hmm. um, and one of, one of the things that's a very great challenge as a priest is to balance all the logistics yeah. that need to happen, right? The, yeah. the host of, of people who are coming and a lot of times pe people qu bring urgent questions about their lives, you know, something, mm -hmm. something to share, a moment of great joy or a moment of great sorrow. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to clarify which reading the lector should read. And you need to check the missile and make sure that no one has moved any pages to right. make sure it's set to the right prayers for the day. Mm -hmm. And then you've got an altar boy who doesn't know how to put on a cincture. And then, and then yes. you know, the, the musician comes and says, like, Father, the soundboard isn't working. And then, and then a light bulb goes. And so you're like up there in the half lit sanctuary and you've got like half a choir and like an altar boy who's, you know, belt keeps falling down and, and, and this is God's work. None of this is hypothetical. Like once again, none of this is hypothetical. All so, of that has so, happened. So let, let me, let, let me back up just, just a little bit to this point about the sacristy. Um, what, what is it, what is it that a priest is doing as, as he's vesting for the mass um, because uh, because some, something important is happening there in that moment. Yeah, I mean, there's traditionally always a set of prayers um, that the priest prays as he puts on each, um, because there's a number of different vestments that, that he will vest in, but um, it's, it's good to be uh, recollected at that point. Um, there are many days where it's like, you know, you have meetings right up until mass or your alarm doesn't go off and you're like rushing around, but you always have to, um, kind of take that time to take a deep breath and, you know, look at the cross and, you know, every sacristy, you know, should have that, that cross in there so that you're turn your eyes to him before you turn towards the altar and be mindful of that. And so as those preparations take place, um, you know, it, it should be a place of prayer. Um, I remember that was a, a unique change of mentality maybe, or something that I needed to like switch my, my thought process on when I entered the religious life that we talked about our um, monastic cell as a real place of prayer. And I was like, well, that's my bedroom. That's, you know, it's like, no, this is, this is a place of prayer. And uh, for us, I think, you know, the sacristy is not some place that is a storage closet. It's not an ante room or a place that we just store a bunch of sacred vessels or vestments. It, it too is a place of prayer. And so there should be even though real preparations have to happen, real conversations happen. Is this the feast day today? What are we doing here? How many concelebrants we have? You know, there's conversations that need to take place, but to treat the sacristy as a place of prayer. Now, it doesn't need to have an, an, like an uber solemn presence and it's not a chapel per se, but it is a place of prayer. And to not be afraid to say, yeah, actually, can we have that conversation elsewhere? You know, can we can we follow up on something else like this is going to be a place that I need to prepare and actually be a prayerful environment. So it shouldn't be a super raucous place or anything like that, but to treat it as a place of prayer. Yeah. Sports game people tell me that a good sacristy is like a good locker room. Mm hmm. Because I love when, it. Yeah, when you're when you're heading out for the big game, they, they tell me because I've never once in my life done this sports. Balls. But when, you're, when you're heading out for the big game, you have to be focused. You have to be attentive. Mm -hmm. People have to be on the same page. The plan has to be there and the mindset has to have 
kicked in yeah. so that the work can be accomplished. And yeah, you can see this in a team where where a, the coach hasn't gotten everybody to the same page, where the focus yeah. isn't yeah, there, yeah, yeah. and you leave the locker room and it's distressed, and the performance suffers. Yeah, um, and you you approach the game, you know, with a kind of spirit of um, well disunity. Um, and that 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 analogy, I, th- I think, is 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 right on um, with with entering the holy sacrifice of the mass. One of my favorite moments, one of my absolute favorite sacristy moments, um, was this past year. Uh, one of our one of our friars, uh, Father Jonah, was down visiting, um, and it happened to be Ash Wednesday. Um, I put a lot of pressure on myself uh, for the big feast days. Ash Wednesday, Christmas, Easter, because it's like, I, this is such a privileged time. There's a lot going on. I want to make sure that the preaching is on point and everything like that. So we're there getting ready for the morning mass, Ash Wednesday. It's like, this is big. This is going to be big, right? And so vested up and I did. I started my nervous walk. You know, when I'm uncomfortable, I just start pacing around and I'm just like <laughs> nervously walking in silence, my head's down and I'm just walking and I was like, all right. And I look up uh, to Father Jonah to my right and I'm like, man, this feels like, this just feels like, you know, right before the state championship game, <laughs> right? Like I'm just like geared up, queued up, ready to go and on oh. point without missing a beat. Father Jonah turns to me and goes, clear eyes, full heart. And I go, can't lose. It would open the door, <laughs> rang the bell. I was like, let's go. <laughs> It was perfect. <laughs> Clear eyes, <laughs> full art, can't, can't lose. lose. <laughs> Incredible. Uh, but but of course the the, the liturgy the liturgy is uh, is so much more than than yeah. just a game. I mean, um, uh, Pope Benedict has a great analogy of how the liturgies play, and the, the, you know there there are interesting and me- meaningful ways to look at it here. Um, but fundamentally, Father Joseph Anthony, what is it that the priest? is doing when he, when he leaves the sacristy. Mm-hmm. So as we, as we've been saying, there's something important that happens in the sacristy that the priest is, is collecting himself for, but, but, but what is that work? What is it that the mm-hmm. priest does in the mass? Because the mass is not just for him. And I, th- and I think that's important for, for, for people to know that this is at the heart of how the priest realizes um, yeah. or, or understands rather what's going on at mass. Yeah. Um, I remember being in college and meeting a very holy uh, priest who later on in his life went and did um, a tremendous amount of mission work um, in Mexico and uh, in Central America as well. And when I was talking to him about a similar question and he mentioned how every time he walks up that center aisle, he is actually taking on the burdens in the prayers of the people of God on his back as he walks down that center aisle. And I was like, well, what do you mean by like, what do you mean? You shouldn't take that on. That's not yours to take on. He's like, no, but it is. And I, I collect it. I draw it into myself as I walk down that center aisle, pew by pew. I'm saying, okay, now they're on my, now they're on me. Now they're on me. He goes, and then I climb and ascend those stairs. And now I'm step like toe to toe in front of the father. And my role is to carry all that these people have, all that they've brought into this church. And my job is to carry that up into the presence of the father and surrender it and hand it to him. And that is, that's one of the most beautiful things that even, um, even in those moments where we celebrate, you know, a mass without a congregation, uh, a private mass or things like that, we are offering that sacrifice on behalf of the people of God. And we carry that into the presence of the Father. Um, one of the things that I know that we discussed uh, pre-show about talking about is if you look at the Mass, the entirety of the Mass, all of the prayers um, explicitly, except one prayer, um, which you know is one of my favorites, but all of the prayers in the Mass are oriented to the Father. It's a prayer to the Father of the mystical body of Christ, the, the, the Son of God speaking to the father. And so as the priest, I get to vocalize that prayer, but on behalf of all of those that I'm leading closer to the father. And so I carry those intentions. I carry those burdens. I carry all of that up the hill, up the mountain into the presence of the father in Orient. And yes, I, I, as the priest, in the one who who offers the sacrifice, and I'm the priest who verbalizes these prayers and things. But it's not just because it's nice religious poetry 
that's on a dramatic show or a ritualized formula that said, but these are prayers that I get to vocalize and I lend my voice to on behalf of the, the people of God speaking to the father. So there are real prayers to beseech his mercy, to be, beseech his grace and strengthen us. You know, this uh, one of the colleagues for this past or recent week was talking about the grace of adoption. You who have adopted us as your sons and daughters, you know, and, and, and to, to really vocalize those prayers have a tre tremendous impact on the priest. It really does affect me to say like, Yes, yes, this is the realities in front of us. And I'm speaking that on behalf of those who maybe can't vocalize it themselves, but know that reality. Right. And I, I think this is the pain where a priest who becomes too much of a showman yeah. loses loses a sense of, of what is actually happening. Because it, it can't be about the priest at mass. Um, it can't be about the priest orienting himself um, mentally or physically to the people. Um, because the priest is actually... Uh, lifting up minds and hearts to God, mm -hmm. and it, mm -hmm. so it's so it's wrong to consider the mass a dialogue between the priest and the people. It oh, is no. correct to understand the mass as a dialogue between the priest on behalf of the people and God. And so, so I, so, so I, that's what I was hearing, you know, in your in your comment here. And so I invite our listeners, you know, to begin to listen to the prayers of the mass and focus on how the priest addresses God, and not you. Yeah, actually, yeah, um, because the priest. The priest is carrying carrying the prayers of your hearts, as Father Joseph Anthony said, um, to God, and so so that this plays out this plays out and has a number of ramifications. And we, we we don't really have time to go in, into that, but but again, um, there there's a there's a beautiful moment in the mass um, where uh, where the priest lifts up um, the consecrated gifts, mm -hmm. right? So he's lifting up the bread, um, which has become the body of Christ, and the chalice, which has. Um, which which holds the precious blood of Christ, right? So he's so he's got the patent, the dish, and and the chalice. And what's amazing is that um, oftentimes the priest can see his own reflection in those vessels. Yeah. yeah. And the temptation is for the priest to look at himself instead of looking mm -hmm. at the sacred gifts that he's offering, instead of seeing Christ, who he is handing over to the Father. And I think that, that it's important for us to, to, to continue to reflect on the ways that liturgy uh, is in, in service of the people and not in service of the priest's ego. Um, and so that begins with a, with a kind of mentality from the priest, um, but, but a shared understanding from the people uh, of, that, of that rightly ordered mentality so that priest and people are looking together to the Father. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that when... Um, you mentioned there's a aspect of the dialogue, and th and that was a term that uh, was was used very uh, commonly, like dialogue mass or things like that. And there are definite moments where the priest invites the people to join, or invites the people to give their acclamation, their response to things. And the, and this is helping to foster that understanding that the priest is offering this in union with with the people, and that this isn't about his ego. The center point isn't him but he is a, a, a vital role, but to offer the sacrifice in union and on behalf of the mystical body of Christ. Those that are gathered in that place and those that maybe are unable to gather, those that maybe have desires, but don't know exactly how to worship God mm, properly. Mm, mm. Um, there are some really beautiful moments where the priest says, you know, for those that are gathered here, those who seek you with a sincere heart, I offer the sacrifice. And there's a way that you're always mindful that this is not a, a play acting drama for my own um, ego, as you said, but this is, there are moments that the, uh, the people have a beautiful opportunity to give their assent or to give, to acclaim the realities that are in front of them. But it reinforces that priest to say, okay, this is all of us together turning towards Christ or turning towards God. Um, in union with Christ who's present here on this altar. Um, one of my favorite parts of the mass uh, is uh, right at the offertory um, where the priest turns to the people and says, pray brothers and sisters that this, my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the almighty father. And the people are just, may the sacrifice at your hands um, 
blah, 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 blah. You know, saying these things outside of liturgical context, I always uh, afraid I, I get them messed up. So I'll throw blah, blah, blahs in there. Um, but that's a really pivotal moment because the priest in addressing the people mentions multiple sacrifices. This, my sacrifice and yours. And then the people then affirm the fact that there is a singular sacrifice, may the sacrifice at your hands. And so they join all of those into a singular sacrifice. Now that now the responsibility, the burden is on the priest mm. to take that. Now that's a heavy burden. Now I've, I've gathered all of these into a singular sacrifice that now I get to offer on behalf of these people. And it's a really pivotal moment and it reinforces that understanding that this is a work done for these people. And it's not to see my authority as like uh, have this stage and a platform to do whatever I want, but it is attentive to the needs that are being brought by the people of God. Um, and I think that's to see then that there's kind of this pivotal linchpin that the priest plays where he goes to God on behalf of the people, but also he has the privilege to return from God to those people carrying the mercies, the love, the forgiveness, and even the true body and blood of the son mm. to give to them. And so the priest has this kind of twofold motion, right? you know, right. Right. carrying the right. people to the father right. and then returning right. from the father back to the people with the mercies right. and love of God. Right. So we talked a little bit, uh, you know, about preparation, about this work that is accomplished. Um, so in, in the last moments that remain here, um, as, as we're wrapping up, do you, what do you offer as far as a Thanksgiving goes, mm -hmm. as far as after mass goes? Okay. So you're, so you're walking off, you know, the, the sacrifice having concluded the work of God having been done. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What do you do? Yeah. Yeah. Um, majority of the Sundays you stand out in the, the vestibule or the, the link or whatever it may be. And you greet the people. Right. And that's, that's, that's where it gets kind of chaos and you, you meet, you see the people face to face. And sometimes you have a lot of small talk and chit chat. And if you're lucky enough, you got some coffee and donuts that you got to make your way over to. Um, but there's always that moment where you go back to the sacristy to take the vestments off. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is once again, the way I've always approached it is that you just walk in that sacristy and you take a deep breath and you say, thank you. Um, and once again, this is where that sacristy really becomes a place of prayer. Um, and you can be in that sacristy and, and not just stripping the vestments off as quickly as possible, but to like take that deep breath to recognize the work has been accomplished because it's not yours, but it is the Lord's work that you have had the privilege to participate in. And you just simply say thank you to the Lord. Um, and I think as a priest that those, those very brief, but very important moments before and after the mass in the same or in the sacristy can, can really make or break and change things. Mm -hmm. And, and it separates the action, the event of the mass, if you want to call it that from every other thing that we do, every other professional obligation that we have to do in our daily mundane run of the mill stuff. But it makes that a truly sacred moment and sacred event that we got to participate in. Right. I found myself over the years, you know, wanting, wanting to do something um, particular for my prayer of Thanksgiving. Yeah. Um, you know, so I've, so I've picked up um, and, and maybe this is recited in, uh, in your church among the people uh, or, or, or maybe you have this custom, but, but I say the same Michael prayer, yeah. you know, even yeah. to myself as I'm divesting, right. Uh, but, but a prayer, a prayer of Thanksgiving, recognizing um, the, the work of God um, and the power of God's grace mm -hmm. uh, and that, what that power can do against the evils of the world. So I think the St. Michael prayer is a, a great little prayer of Thanksgiving uh, that can be adopted by any Catholic, whether it's said by the congregation or, or said individually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's a word of thanks to all of our listeners. Uh, we appreciate you tuning in for this episode of God's Planning. Follow us on Facebook, the artist formerly known as Twitter, Instagram or wherever else we are, we're still on um, TikTok. Like, subscribe, and leave a five star review. If you'd like to donate to the podcast through Patreon, follow the link in the description in the show notes there. You can also follow links in the description to shop God's Waiting merch and to get information on upcoming God's Planning events. Uh, this is the last call for our young adult retreat. So sign up um, for that retreat. Um, and 
Yeah, I think that's all I want to say. Yeah, I think so. I think we covered it all. And <laughs> thanks for listening. God bless. Father Jacob Bertrand. Father Gregory. A Dominican, a Franciscan, and a Jesuit walk into a bar. One of them asks the audience to subscribe. That's not a joke. Uh, any ways you can improve upon it? Just don't tell jokes. Right. This is not a joke. Please subscribe. Cheers.